Welcome back to the Banners broadcast. I'm Chris Grenham, and with me, as always, founder, C- CEO, CLNS Media, Nick Gelso. Nick, what's up, man? What's up, man? You're always making me look good with all these tagline titles. You have the tags. You need How about the tags. just like the hot take machine on the Garden Fort? <laughs> the, work. the hot take machine from the Garden Fort, Nick Gelso. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's good. So, yeah, Nick, we're, we're through one game. The regular season has started. Obviously, that was Tuesday night. Uh, a big win over the Philadelphia 76ers. What do you what do you think? The Garden was bumping. I was pretty impressed. There was a Red Sox playoff game that night. I wasn't sure if it was going to be that crazy in there with a little Red Sox distraction, but it was loud in there. Dude, it was like a play. It was like game seven of like the conference finals. Marcus Morris said it. He said it was going to be a playoff atmosphere. I have to say, I mean, I think I, we sat together. We're, uh, you're like we're like the two old men in the Muppets now, up in the <laughs> That's sitting it, yeah. together. But, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I haven't seen an opener like that since the old big, uh, the old new big three. Uh, you know, with KG and Paul and them. And uh, I knew it though. We did uh, Causeway Street and CLNS did that tip off party at the Harp, and right. when I saw 400 people in there drinking their faces off, I thought, uh oh. <laughs> Yeah, it was going to be a pretty rowdy environment, and it was. And it it was. was loud. It was loud. Whenever Simmons, Fulter, and Bede got the ball, that place went absolutely ballistic. Yeah, absolutely nuts. And I, I was pretty impressed. You know, Embiid did get his. He's kind of – that's kind of a guarantee, you know, going forward. He had finished with 23 mm-hmm. points, which was game high, alongside Jason Tatum, who also had 23, who a lot of Celtics fans are basically saying, you know, he's Michael Jordan now. <laughs> um, which he might be better. I don't know. Jason Tatum is <laughs> oh, on. Here we go <laughs> but I think uh, I think the Celtics did a really good job with Joel Embiid. You know, they didn't start Aaron Baines, but Aaron Baines did play some really quality minutes, which he did in the playoffs, and he's been so good against Joel Embiid in the past. And people, when they talk about the depth of this team, they talk about Terry Rozier and they talk about Marcus Smart and Marcus Morris, but Aaron Baines is always towards the bottom of that list. He's so important for this team, and he's so damn consistent. It's awesome. I love watching him play. Yeah, I mean, you had, you had recognized he's pretty unathletic. I mean, you recognize he shoots threes off the wrong foot. It's, it, it's kind of bizarre. That's a, yeah, that's a crazy it's thing. It's his energy, his strength, um, his hustle. And really, I mean, just being an enforcer, there was a guy when I was growing up called Mark Eaton. He played for the Utah Jazz. They used okay. to call him the Man Mountain. And that's kind of what, that's kind of Baines. what Aaron Baines is. Yeah, Baines is – you. it's interesting watching him followed by Horford or vice versa because you watch Horford play against Joel Embiid and he's got that long, really, really high IQ style of defense where he keeps Embiid away from the basket. He forces him out towards the perimeter, but not really – by you know forcing him out of his body he's cutting off passing lanes and and he's one step ahead of him when you look at Baines Baines just gives up no ground it's like Embiid can smash into him again and again and again he gives up zero ground whatsoever it's pretty awesome and I I think that combination or varying it 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 mess it messes with Embiid's head totally um he doesn't know how how he's going to be played from you know player to player between Horford and Baines, you just said it all when you said it. They're just such different styles. And I don't know that Embiid at this point in his career can shift his offensive style quick enough yeah. to kind of um, compensate for yeah, that. And Baines the... has been tremendous. And it's a test. To, it's a testament to Brad Stevens saying it doesn't matter who starts the game. Because you look at the meaningful minutes, and, and, and Baines had meaningful minutes on opening night. And here's a guy who just never complains, goes to work with his lunch pail every day, mm-hmm. and uh, – I'm just so glad he, he resigned with the Celtics and is so excited to be here. Absolute steal of a contract, too. That was there. Mm-hmm. Com- he's completely invaluable to this team. It's awesome. But I think uh, you talked about the minutes real quick before we get towards this Toronto preview. We're recording on Friday morning, so uh, the Celtics had their second game of the season against the Toronto Raptors in Toronto tonight. First game of a back-to-back before they head to Madison Square Garden against the Knicks tomorrow night. But You'll be there. Inter- I'll be there. I'll be at MSG. The minutes, Brad Stevens, I don't know if he'll be this perfect every game. I don't I don't think that's possible. But his spreading out of these minutes was flawless. I mean, Al Horford led the team with 30. And then you had Kyrie and Jason Tatum at 29, JB at 28, Rozier at 27, Marcus Smart and Hayward at 25. It was like it could not have been more uh, perfectly distributed. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was ridiculous. 
Uh, yeah, and I, I think it, you're right. You're not going to be able to see that every single game, but I think with the depth, you're going to be able to see it a good portion of the games. Right. Because he has that flexibility to be able to to go deep into that bench and not have uh, the second unit lose leads or or create bigger gaps in what is already maybe a deficit going into the bench. So uh, he has the ability to do it. He's the coach that can do it. So. I'm not surprised. And and if this is the way it's going to go all season, of course, it's only one game. But if this is the way it's going to, going to go all season, then, you know, knock on wood, hopefully the, the distribution of minutes saves legs on guys like Horford, Hayward, and and, uh, and Irving. Yeah, totally. And you can have a game where Kyrie Irving goes two for 14, That's Gordon cr- Hayward goes two. four for 12, and they still smack the 76ers. And like I, it, I, it didn't towards the second half. It it felt like that game was in hand the entire time, and they had such bad shooting nights. It's almost I've never been so excited for your two stars to have such bad shooting nights. <laughs> right? That's a good I mean, point. Like we, yeah, we filmed after the game and down on the court, and it was like, what are we gonna do? Hayward yeah. and, and Irving looked just so discombobulated. Dude, we won by how many points? It was a double-digit win. A 105-87 win, yeah, with those crappy nights. And that kind of depth is really going to come into play against teams like the Toronto Raptors, who the Celtics play tonight. I talked about it with NBA TV's Matt Weiner, who we have on today's show. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But, you know, that's a team that is a little bit better on the defensive side of the ball than the Philadelphia 76ers. A lot of people think that the Raptors are the biggest threat to the Celtics. But... What's your thoughts on the whole, you know, away from the X's and O's matchup stuff? Yeah, please no X's. What do you, and what O's. do you think about the <laughs> what do you think <laughs> about the whole Ka- Kawhi Leonard situation? You think that's going to work? You think he'll stick around? Oh around? man, what? it's so overdone, Chris. Come on. I don't know. I don't know until we start seeing basketball. Tonight's going to be so interesting. You don't to know see. what's going on inside Leonard's head? No, no, I don't think Leonard knows what's going on inside <laughs> Leonard's head. Um, poor guy, that poor guy. You know, he's been quiet for so long. He speaks out once at media day, laughs a little awkward, very awkwardly, in fact, and just gets <laughs> roasted. I feel horrible who, for the guy. We we talked about this last week, though. I mean, like, you put yourself in that position when you not only de- you, you, ref- you, you hold out and then you demand yeah. a trade from Greg Popovich. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It's such it, a weird situation. It's a weird. There's more to it than maybe we'll ever know, but... On the exterior, it looks very fishy to me like someone, you know, basically you just have to look at the historical facts. No one has ever wanted to leave the Spurs or Pop. I don't know anybody who has. Most people want to come to San Antonio. I'll go play with them. I'll play for Pop I'll I'll just go. I'll go sit on the sidelines, man. I'll just go be the ball boy. It, it, It is a really weird situation. I mean, I don't think I've, like you said, I don't think I've ever heard of anyone trying to get out of Pop's umbrella there of his coaching umbrella. I I don't really know what's going on, but I wouldn't be surprised if Kawhi does stick around in Toronto if things do go well. I mean, it's all about forming that relationship. You saw it with Sam Presti and the Thunder last year with Paul George. They did it, and mm-hmm. Oklahoma City is not a very, very appealing city to live in, I wouldn't think, compared to, say, uh, Los no. Angeles. I don't know. If or ever, Toronto, for that Or matter. Toronto. Toronto's a great city. So I, uh, or San Antonio. Yeah, and again, I feel like we're going to be doing this all year. So let's we are. So let's <laughs> let's get to uh, let's get to NBA TV's Matt Weiner. Uh, the Celtics play host to the Orlando Magic on Monday night, seven thirty at the Garden, and it will be on NBA TV. So let's uh, get to our interview with Matt Weiner. Anyway, Chris, I, we have a we have a we're powered today. We have a sponsor. Powered. Uh, yeah, man, we got power. One in one hundred. It's a brand new way to get involved in sports and, and concert events. Boston sports fans, they can get killer seats to see Celtics, Bruins, Patriots, or Red Sox for the price of a beer or even a large pizza. It could even be less. Chris, people are tired of p- paying inflated broker prices for for tickets, and now with oh, one in one hundred, rightfully so. Oh, dude! I mean, how about when they? Never mind. I'm not going to bash. But <laughs> go to one in one hundred dot co. That's one in one hundred dot co. O n e i n the number one, the number zero, the number zero dot. CO. Now, how are you going to forget that? That's a unique URL. And there, the novelty in 1 in 100, you'll know, is that there's no other place online that's doing online raffles for tickets and sporting events like they are. It's a totally brand new way to get involved, try to get tickets uh, to concerts, sporting events, even to our Celtics. So the cost potentially to score tickets with 1 in 100 is a small fraction of the actual ticket price. 
score a pair of tickets for less than the cost of a beer. Your first raffle ticket is free after sign up. So, dude, you can even get into these games or concerts for free. I'm in the Elton John raffle right now because I cannot believe they're charging $300 yeah, for balcony insane. seats at TD Garden. That's crazy. <laughs> so, I got in the raffle for like, I think, six bucks at one in 100. So go over, experience it. It's ex- it's really fun and it's exciting. You can pick your own number, get the feeling of potentially scoring premium tickets. If you're feeling lucky, go on over to onein100.co. That's O N E I N, the number one, the number zero, the number zero dot C O. Dude, they have been all over our programming, a really good partner of ours. So if you, you're a fan of the Banners broadcast or any CLNS programming, please. Check them out. Check them out. 101.co. All right, and now we welcome in NBA TV host Matt Weiner. Matt, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem, no problem. So, of course, the Celtics opened up their season, opened up the NBA season on Tuesday night with a strong 105-87 win over to, over the Philadelphia 76ers. We are recording this on Friday morning, the morning of Game 2 of their schedule against the Toronto Raptors. Then they travel to... New York to face the Knicks on Saturday and then Monday night against the Orlando Magic at 7:30 on NBA TV at TD Garden. So let's start with your early impressions here of the Celtics in their first game. Uh you know, it's tough to grab immediate reactions of course from the first game or even the first week or two of the season, but what would you think of their pretty strong performance against the Sixers on Tuesday night? Yeah, I guess my initial reaction was that I wasn't surprised by much of anything I saw, and that's that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a little rust for Kyrie, a little rust for Gordon Hayward. That's to be expected uh, in both cases. Maybe in Kyrie's case, just a bad shooting night, and that's, that's going to happen from time to time as well. But, you know, the, the Celtics have improved every season since Brad Stevens arrived, and based on game number one, there's no reason to think that they won't win more than the 55 from last year. And assuming that everybody is healthy, um, they're the deepest team in the East and maybe the league. Uh, won easily without big scoring nights from those, those two guys who just figured to get better and better over the course of the season. There's a lot to like there. Yeah, that depth that you mentioned is obviously pretty key there. I think it's amazing to see Kyrie Irving go 2 for 14 and Gordon Hayward go 4 for 12, and they still can you know, put up a double digit win against an Eastern conference contender. My question for you, interesting. I heard it proposed on Twitter the other day and I've kind of gone back and forth. Say Gordon Hayward doesn't return to the player that he once was with Utah. Obviously it's tough coming back from an injury like that. And he's going to be rusty. I think until December, maybe even January until he gets his yeah, full, it's, you know, it's going to be a while. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a while. Say he doesn't return to his, you know, old normal self. Do you think the Celtics still have a chance to, you know, give the Warriors a chance? Or do you think they need that Gordon Hayward difference there? Oh, we've already already put him in the finals, have we? Yeah, for most people, that's what the debate was on Twitter. So, yeah, that's my my debate here. I like that. We've skipped right over the first three rounds of the postseason. We've (laughs) jumped right to to the NBA finals. (laughs) Uh, Do they still have a chance? I, I don't – look, they're not going to be favored. Even with a healthy Gordon Hayward, they wouldn't be favored against the Warriors in the NBA Finals, right. again, assuming everybody's healthy as things stand. Um, without him at his – close to his peak, that's a tall order. But, look, Jason Tatum gets better every time you turn around, it seems like. Mm-hmm. Um, are they appreciably worse if Jason Tatum improves a little bit over a great rookie season – and Hayward is just average. Uh, yeah, I guess a, a little bit, but but not a ton. But I'm not sure there's any scenario where I'm picking the Celtics to beat the Warriors in a seven-game series, although I think they're, matchup-wise, I think they're they're reasonably well-suited to give them a go. Yeah, I think they're, they're probably the biggest threat to Golden State in, you know, the last few years. I don't think they have enough to, to beat them. That depth becomes a really major factor in a seven-game series, but... I still think Golden State is a little too talented. Uh, But let's stick towards the Eastern Conference here and focus on the 76ers, who the Celtics beat on Tuesday night. What would you see from them? Obviously, they were missing guys like Wilson Chandler and Mike Muscala, which are pretty key depth pieces for that group. Do you think they improved over this offseason? Where where do you think they stand right now? I think Chandler was a really important pickup for them, a veteran wing who can shoot a little bit and can do a bunch of things defensively. 
I don't know that they got better in the short term. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marco Bellinelli, Ursan Ilyasova were huge for them down the stretch of last season, and it's still a mystery to me how they somehow picked them up for nothing uh, yeah. after the uh, trade deadline and waiver deadline. Um, but the fact that they're starting Markel Fultz, which I think is probably the right thing to do, and trying to develop him with a team that won 52, that's a little tricky. It, it makes sense for them, but it is a little tricky in terms of immediate uh, returns. Uh, it makes sense because he should be part of their core moving forward. But I'm not sure that they're a better team other than uh, the improvement you would hope for from guys like Ben Simmons and, and Joel Embiid. They're still a really good team. Certainly a really, really talented team, but uh, you saw what happened in the playoff series with the Celtics when they showed some warts in terms of execution late in games. There's a, you know, there's still a, a, a kind of a growth curve for them, a learning curve for them on how to finish games in a playoff setting, and Fultz is going to have to be part of that as well. So I, I think you're looking at a Philadelphia team that's probably roughly where they were last year. Um, and, and that may go for the playoffs as well in terms of the, the inexperience. Yeah, I think you what you mentioned with gaining another year of experience, essentially, for guys like Ben Simmons and, and uh, Joel Embiid is the most important portion of this team's growth over the offseason. I think that is pretty key going forward. You mentioned Markel Fultz, of course. What do you think? Do you think he should be starting right now? There's a lot of debate currently with his... For, granted, it's only the first two games, so we're yeah. jumping to a lot of conclusions here, but... Do you think they would, you know, should start with JJ Redick going forward here until Fultz gets a little more comfortable? Do you think they're smart to ride with Fultz right now in the starting lineup? What are your thoughts there? Well, I think it's it's a signal, first of all, that he is part of their future, mm-hmm. that they're going to start him. And Brett Brown is, has said over and over again, look, we're not committed to playing him X number of minutes. And you saw that in the Boston game the other night. Right. I think he only played three minutes after halftime. So, you know, part of it is symbolic. Um, this is our guy. He was the number one overall pick. We're going to ride with him. We're going to see what he is. We're going to help develop him or grow him, as Brett Brown says to anybody who will ask. Um, so I, I think it does make sense. J.J. Reddick's a veteran. You know, he sees how this team, how the organization is developing. He knows what's going on. Uh, I think he'll be a good soldier, first of all. He's a, he's a professional, and he'll be a good player for them. So I don't I don't see it as a problem at all because – Brown can play him as much or as little as his performance dictates while trying to get him enough minutes to to see what they have, first of all, and help him gain some confidence over the course of what is essentially his second rookie season. Yeah, and they've done a, Brett Brown's done a lot of that with starting J.J. Redick in the second half, like you said. So it's an interesting pattern that we'll have to just wait and see over the next month or so to see how it plays out to begin the season do you think the Sixers are you know most people are picking the Celtics to win the Eastern Conference there's a little variance there with the Sixers and with the Raptors do you think one of those two teams is the biggest threat who would you say is the biggest threat to dethrone the Celtics even though they haven't even won the Eastern Conference yet? <laughs> can you be dethroned you I don't think you I don't, I don't think you can but according to a lot of these preseason projections they could be I think by definition, you have to occupy a throne before someone can dethrone you. Yeah, I think um, that, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, well, here's best guess. I, I feel more certain about the Celtics having the best record in the regular season in the Eastern Conference. Okay. Uh, there's continuity there, and, and the depth that I mentioned, that really comes into play over the course of a long 82-game season because guys are going to come and go from the lineup, hopefully for Celtics fans. Uh, these are, you know, short term things, but, you know, people get hurt and they, they leave the lineup for periods of time. Boston has the kind of depth to withstand that and still be a good team. So I, I that's I wouldn't say it's a lock, but I feel pretty certain that they should have the best record in the Eastern Conference postseason. I'd still pick them. Toronto is interesting to me um, and, and a little overlooked, I think, for a team that had the best record in the conference last year. Mm-hmm. And, and granted, they weren't good in the playoffs, but you're talking about a team that set a franchise record for wins last year and arguably picked up the best player in the conference over the summer. Right. Kawhi Leonard, if, if he is healthy, if he is right, regardless of where his mind is in terms of what he's going to do next summer, he is an issue for, for the rest of the league on both ends of the floor. Two years ago, he was widely recognized as the best two-way player in the entire league. You know, last year, obviously the quad injury and all the drama associated with his treatment and the way he and his team interacted with the Spurs overshadowed his ability. 
And there certainly are questions about his health moving forward, but that's the kind of guy who can make a difference in a playoff series. I, I thought Masai Ujiri was, was right on to make the gamble and trade away an established all-star in DeMar DeRozan, who was such a big part of their culture, for a guy who's frankly just a, a better overall player. And if it doesn't work out and he walks next summer, okay, well, you, you kind of start over a little bit. But it felt like that team had capped out with Dwayne Casey, with DeRozan and Lowry. Um, they're able to turn the page, maybe make something really interesting happen under Nick Nurse and with Kawhi in that lineup. So I, I, I wouldn't overlook them. Um, I, I'm still picking Boston on both counts, regular season and postseason. But, but Toronto could be really good. Yeah, Toronto's going to be an interesting case. Obviously, with Nick Nurse coming in there, I think he's going to he's going to be a nice change in the coaching area for that team. And Kawhi Leonard, I mean, if he can return to ninety percent of what he was, he's such a great two way player. He's going to be a major major threat in this Eastern Conference. You yeah, know, he, he was great the other night. Not to he was. But no, no, no. You, you know, our guys, uh, a couple of our guys, the veteran guys, Isaiah Thomas, uh, Grant Hill. I forget who else I was talking to about mm-hmm. this. Uh, about Nick Nurse. Nick Nurse is interesting, and this is not a knock on Nick Nurse at all, but he's an unknown quantity as an NBA coach. You, you know, he was a name you heard uh, as an up-and-comer, and he's well-regarded, obviously, in the organization, or he wouldn't have gotten that job. But how does Kawhi interact with Nick Nurse, where he's only had Greg Popovich as his head coach? Uh, you know, Greg Popovich, obviously, is a, a legendary NBA head coach. Folks who have played for him tell you he is a genius, and he, he is clearly the guy who runs the show in San Antonio. Nick Nurse is coming up as a first-year head coach. What's that relationship like? That could play a huge part in how successful this team is. Totally, yeah. And there, and even besides Kawhi Leonard, that's an established team as a whole. So it, it is interesting, and you rarely see that with a new coach coming in from a te- to a team excuse me, that had such a successful season the year before. But I agree with the move. I mean, you kind of had to get some sort of change in the guard, obviously, they were going to, in my opinion, they were going to stay rather stagnant in where they were and uh, a lack of playoff progress, if you if you would. Yep. So um, let's move towards the bottom of the Eastern Conference. Obviously, the top, I think, is pretty strong, doesn't always get uh, as much credit as it should, even the middle with teams like the Wizards and the Pacers in there. But if you go to the bottom, you have a lot of younger, raw teams like the Orlando Magic, who are coming to Boston on Monday night, like the New York Knicks, the Atlanta Hawks. There's a couple teams there. So Let's focus on the Magic briefly because obviously that's the NBA TV game on Monday night. They looked pretty good in their first game against the Miami Heat with Mo Bamba making his debut. They won 104 to 101 against a team in Miami that a lot of people think is a playoff team in the Eastern Conference. So it's tough to take away anything from a really young team like that early in the season. But were you surprised by that early season win? What do you think? Not surprised by that game, not necessarily, but I, you know, I'll say this after wandering through the NBA forest for so many years, <laughs> it feels like the magic have finally found the trail. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aaron Gordon was really good Wednesday night. They've committed to him financially. Mo Bamba might turn out to be a star. I'm not going to, you know, put that on him after one game, but he was <laughs> really good. Yeah. Uh, and, and I like that they're bringing him off the bench behind an established veteran in, in Nick Vucevic. Um, and we'll get to see what Jonathan Isaac can do this year after missing so much of, the, of his rookie season. Uh, Vucevic, remember, comes off the books next summer, so there's some, some cap flexibility. They need a, a long term point guard solution, clearly. Yeah. I've always liked DJ Augustine, but he's probably not the guy to develop with these young guys if if the plan works out. But, you know, after lacking an identity and a direction for so long, they turned over management last year. Now they have Steve Clifford, uh, a really solid NBA head coach. It feels like maybe they've turned a corner at least. That, that probably doesn't mean they're a playoff team this year, but it feels like they're on a path kind of like, you know, somebody like the Chicago Bulls who, right. who aren't ready, but at least you kind of see where they're going. And for a long time, you couldn't say that about the Magic, the way you couldn't say that about the Phoenix Suns. They were just, you know, you would kind of scratch your head and go, what are they doing? And now at least you have some semblance of an idea of what they're doing. Yeah, there's a road there, and that's important for a lot of these young NBA teams. And a team like the Magic can cause some matchup issues for the Boston Celtics because you've seen the Celtics in the past try and play big and start Aaron Baines instead of Al Horford at times. Sometimes when they match up against the Philadelphia 76ers to combat Joel Embiid, 
you go up against a team like the Magic with some longer athletic guys like Bamba, like Isaac, even Vucic. I mean, they're they're a tough matchup for teams despite being so young. Uh, do you see the Celtics making any adjustments on on Monday night to combat that long athleticism? I, I don't know that they'll need to do anything different against a team like Orlando. They, you know, they do have length, but uh, they're they're not established players. Um, it's not like you're going into the game saying, okay, Jonathan Isaac is going to kill us here, here, and here. Right. Uh, we need to do this to stop him. Um, Brad Stevens is great at in-game adjustments. If, if somebody's a problem, he's got enough people coming off the bench to adjust for whatever that might be. Bamba might be the exception because there just aren't many human beings with that kind of length <laughs> in the world. But, you know, uh, this early in his career, you can't go into the game saying, well, you know, Bamba's going to hit four threes. I know he hit a three the other night. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they'll have to be aware of him as a shot blocker when he's in the game. Uh, but there are other shot blockers, and these guys are pros. I, I, don't, I don't see that as a problem at this point in their development. All right, Matt. So before I let you go here, I'm going to put you on the spot quickly as this is a Celtics show. So mm-hmm. what do you think for a regular season win total for the Celtics? Do you see them maybe – Having to rest guys for the postseason going down the line, do you think they push through 60 wins? What's your what's your projection there? Uh, they're pushing 60 for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll put it at 59, which would be four more than last year. I just think, you know, the playoffs come down to talent and execution. Um, more so in the regular season, depth comes into play because there are you're going to want to rest guys when you can. Uh, you're going to want to, like the other night, you're going to want to be able to play a bunch of guys for 19, 20 minutes if you can get a lead. That's That really comes into play over the regular season, and the Celtics have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to depth. So I, I see no reason they can't improve on last year's total, and I, I'll put the number at 59. All right, be sure to tune in to Matt on Monday night in the NBA TV crew as they cover Magic at Celtics at 730 from TD Garden. Matt, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. All right, thanks again to Matt for coming on and discussing the Eastern Conference. Yeah, Matt's a great guy. He's been in the league for a long time. He knows his stuff. So now we're looking forward. We've got the Knicks on Saturday. You've got the Magic on Monday. A couple young and and raw teams here towards the bottom of the Eastern Conference. There's going to be a lot of those games this year where you're looking at some of these rosters and being like, I probably know about half these guys. Mm -hmm. But... What do you think about the Knicks on Saturday and the Magic on Monday? Give me your thoughts going into both of those games. Jeez, I'm so bad at this, Chris, right? I said, (laughs) oh, there's no way. uh, the I didn't say no way. I wasn't that defined. But I kind of had the Sixers in game one. I thought they were going to come in with more – more gusto and more yeah. a little bit more angry about what happened in the playoffs and it just didn't appear to happen so uh tonight against the raptors um you know we'll see what happens how that chemistry is and and it's a tough place to play celtics tend to struggle in toronto yep. so that'll be interesting as far as new york and orlando goes really they should be um, it really should be a situation where Stevens could rest people, uh, rest some guys, uh, and we're really only in five games into the season by the time, or four games into the season by the time Orlando comes. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised to see him rest somebody on that night because that should be uh, that should be a win. Yeah, I don't know if we'll see them him like sitting guys out yet, but I right. have a feeling rest in terms of minutes is definitely a, a possibility. Like you said, I think you could see him. Limiting some guys if the games do get out of hand. The Knicks game against the Hawks the other night was really bizarre. It started you, out and looked like a pickup game that was just You like, watched that so intent, intently, oh, I you, bet. You, you know you I You love did. these games. Yeah, are you kidding me? If <laughs> now that League games. Pass is back, it's like my dream. I have League Pass on my computer with four games going at once. I have the Red Sox <laughs> playoffs on my TV. It's like Dude, you got to take a picture of that and put like, that on social media. Oh, my God, it's like my dream. You should, By the way, congratulations to, to, to our Boston Red Red Sox, uh, you yeah, know, uh, heading to the World, World Series, Series berth. Let's go. A David Price with the playoff Finally. win. He's off the schneid. And yep. I'm not going to lie, if we, we won't get into too deep a Red Sox discussion, but when I saw Kimbrel coming in from the bullpen last night, the way Evaldi was pitching in the eighth, he looked pretty good. Yep, I was going to vomit all over my yep. living room when I saw Kimbrel coming into that game. But yep. 
Congrats to Alex Cora. Happy belated birthday to Alex yeah, Cora. He's been great, Alex Cora. He's and I, awesome. I got to say, I, I don't know what Boston Radio is going to talk about today if they can't talk about uh, David Price. You got to talk highly about him. He went you out gotta. there and did his a lot thing. Of and crow. A, lot, a lot of people, and I love it because I'm one of them. I'm not the biggest I'm David Price supporter either, but man, he went out and did his thing. And maybe he's what, just going to have to throw a 50 pitch bullpen before every single start now. That's going to be his right. thing. The one thing about Price, and this is, like, well, we're just not a Red Sox show, but <laughs> it's, it's good one. to see a rather unemotional, pouty type guy be emotional in a positive way. And boy, he's really shown it in the last two games and it's good to see him cheering on not just for his own success but his teammates as well so you yeah. can't say anything negative about the guy you can't thank thank god thank god i'm i'm all in on david price i never said anything bad about him i've always loved him we'll we'll <laughs> leave on felger, that we'll, Mads, that's right all, me. me and me and felger have always loved him <laughs> all right nick so i'll be at the garden tomorrow night for nick's celtics we've got celtics raptors tonight at 7 30 and then again nba tv on monday night Magic Celtics at 7.30 from the Garden. Nick, we'll be talking this weekend. Go Red Sox and go Celtics.